was sick. And you looked after me. I need you a teacher. And you inspired me. I was lost. And you prayed for me. I was addicted. And you helped me break free. a mentor and you were there for me I felt alone and you showed me true community you helped me experience the joy of worship you made me feel welcome and safe you gave me the strength to keep going This is the moment of commissioning. Um, I guess it, it's hard with, with COVID to kind of do anything uh, that we would, I would normally like like to do. Uh, it's just not possible with people moving about the place and things like that there. And I know, I know all of the volunteers here were really keen to get up at the front, just get that microphone and really just talk and talk. No, okay. I, I know that's not true. These are quite a shy bunch when it comes to holding a microphone. And I dare say that if, the, if they thought that they wouldn't be asked to come and speak, a lot of them might have been practicing you know, social distancing from home or uh, something like that there just to get out of it. So it is just going to be me talking this evening. I think we'd be kidding ourselves if we pretended that COVID has had no impact on our community, on our church, or on ourselves as individuals, whether it's been financial, whether it has been emotional, whether it has been physical and you have had COVID or you've had friends, family who have contracted it. Maybe I'd say even put myself in this category where it's had more of a mental impact, being cut off from people, not having natural opportunities to talk to people, have a laugh, and then even just there's that we bit of anxiety about heading back into crowds again. Of course, there's the spiritual impact of it all. For those who have not been able to come out to church because of health concerns, to those who have missed the warmth of fellowship that we were talking about this morning. Or perhaps even at a very basic level, though, we have gotten used to living life at a different pace. And the idea of coming forward and being out all the time and giving up time and energy with all these other factors playing a part can be a wee bit daunting and a wee bit overwhelming. So for me it says a lot then that people have been chomping at the bit to get back to serving God. Because maybe you get to the point where you think, well why on earth would you bother? Sounds like an awful lot of work. It seems like there's an awful lot on everyone's plates at the minute. So why would you bother volunteering? Two reasons. Number one, the same needs are there. It's an eternal need. Whether it's adults or students, teenagers, children, toddlers, whatever it happens to be, they need to know the gospel. We have a duty, a responsibility to share the gospel as much and as often, as frequently, as powerfully as we can. They need to know that they've been born and cut off from God because of their sin. And they need to hear about how much Jesus loves them. They need to be persuaded of that, convinced of it. That they might turn from their sin and accept the Savior. That need hasn't changed. It hasn't gone away. It's still there. The second reason is that some needs have changed primarily because of the pandemic. We have children who have missed out on activities and friendships for two years. 
there is a mental toll on our society. There's an emotional toll on our society, on our families. There are people in our community who need a safe place to go. Who need somewhere else just to go. Where they can be heard, where they can be accepted, where there's comfort. True, some adults are better at hiding their scars than some children. They'll be slower to share those scars, but they still feel jaded. They feel that the whole world is turning in on itself and they're looking for a message that makes sense. They're looking for truth that is coherent, consistent. Scripture gives that. It's up to the church collectively across the town, across our problems, across the world, and us specifically to step up and meet those needs, the needs that haven't changed and the needs that have changed, to be conscious of the needs. So with that in mind, I'm going to ask all those in the church who are here tonight who are involved in ministries, whether it's with children or otherwise, um, just that some of the ones here have gotten come up on the screen here, hopefully, whether it's catering, whether it's caretaking, whether it's worship, whether it's the leaders of elders and deacons, whether it's toddle and youth fellowship, youth quick, whether you just make the tea at toddle and whatever it happens to be, I want you to stand, please. Take a look around, folks. These are the people who need you praying for them. And now, if I can, could I ask the rest of you to join with me in standing as we pray. In Jeremiah 1, we read, Ah, Lord God, behold, I do not know how to speak, for I am only a youth. But the Lord said to me, Do not say I am only a youth. For to all to whom I send you, you shall go. And whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for each person who makes our church feel like a home from the youngest to the oldest, to those who have served from the beginning and can't give anymore because their bodies won't let them, to those who are full of youthful ideas and starting off a new chapter in our church. Thank you, Lord. But Lord, we pray that we would, that they would know a deep passion for the work here, that it would be done for your glory, but that it would also be done for your blessing and with your strength. May they feel the power of knowing that they have your words in their mouth. Father, we pray that this year will be one of perpetual joy and blessing. But we know, Lord, that the enemy will endeavor to trip us up and spoil the work, to steal that joy and tarnish your name. So, Lord, we pray that you would keep us wise to his schemes, keep us close to you, and keep our eyes fixed on the prize that's set before us. May the enemy not get a foothold in our lives, but rather be forced to flee from us because your presence is so undeniable, undeniably at work here. May each leader shine for you. May they reflect the beauty of Christ in whichever role they perform here. Let us not grow weary for well-doing, for in due time we believe that we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. This is a promise from Scripture, Lord, and we claim it tonight that we will reap in due time. As a church, make us faithful to the needs of those who serve here. May they know our love. May they know we are praying for them. May they feel the benefit of those prayers weekly. Lord, make serving in this church more than a privilege, but make it a joy. Because people know their efforts are valued. Keep our teams united. Keep them together in a sense of real brotherhood in Christ. But Lord, above all, may none of us ever lose sight of the needs around us. Neither the unchanging eternal needs of those around us, nor the new challenges that emerge from a global pandemic. Father, we commit all into your hands. We commit these wonderful people to you. May they know their worth and know how they are loved. And we ask this in your name. Amen.
I know these are all about to sit down again, but we are going to stand to sing again. Um, <laughs> Maybe to see it. chapter 6. Now I know some of you are already going to tune out going, ah, oh, Jeff, I know this one. Here I am, send me. <laughs> I win. I can go to sleep when you can't be cross. I've heard this one. Okay, well, look, we're not really here to talk about the here I am, send me bit. Honestly, I'm far more interested in how we get to that point. I'm interested in getting to that place where we can be people who say, here I am, send me. Because Isaiah, much like ourselves, has had a tough year. 
And it was impacting how he was serving God. He was restricted. He was in a place where he was running around and he was just giving off at people. Woe is you, woe is you, woe is you. Everything's depressing, everything's bad, everything's rubbish. He was just defeated inside himself. And it was just like he was going around going, nope, 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 not you, not you, not you. These are all rubbish. Frankly, he had lost his stomach for the work. So let's read a couple of the verses and see what we can pull from this to see the turnaround in his life. It says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. The sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips, your guilt is taken away, your sin atoned for. When I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? I said, Here am I. Send me. Okay, so let me just bring it down very quickly. And the first thing that happened was Isaiah saw the Lord. I don't know how you feel that like you've coped with over the shutdown and being shut in. Isaiah has had a rough year as well. He was the, um, the guy who's most famous in the Bible for dying. Isaiah, that seems to be pretty much all that anyone knows about him. Isaiah, Isaiah, yeah. The year that Isaiah died, that's what he's known for, just dying. Well, the year that he died was 739 BC. And actually, he was a really good guy. He was a really godly man, a godly ruler, and ruled the, the nation for over 50 years. He was a real ally to Isaiah. And his death was just another kick in the gut. And I want you to get the sense that he's just dragging himself along to the temple. Just dragging himself to work. He wasn't expecting God to do anything. He wasn't expecting God to show up. He wasn't expecting anything special to happen. He was just going through the motions of just showing up. But that all changed when he saw the Lord. There he was. Yet, even though he had lost the king, he had forgotten that he still had the king of kings. Notice how he describes the Lord, high and exalted, seated on a throne in the temple, and his robe fills the temple. Listen, as we begin a new season of ministry, I need you to see the Lord. Not, not little baby Jesus, meek and mild, but the King, high and enthroned in heaven. However hard it has been this last year and a half, or however hard it is right now, listen to me so very clearly, church, okay? Our God still reigns. Our God still holds all the power and all the authority and all the dominion. He is still on the throne. See it. Feel it. Let your heart soar because of it. Because after a hard year of going through the motions, of feeling a little bit directionless, yes, even if you've lost people along the way, God is still on the throne. Now, did you notice though that Isaiah isn't alone with God? This is the one and only time that we read about the seraphim. Kind of crazy angelic beings with arms and wings where arms and wings shouldn't really be. But their one role is to declare and to worship God. And what's the song that they sing? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. Isaiah thought the world was full of despair. He thought the world was falling apart. But that's not how heaven saw it. And they have a better view than Isaiah. They have a better view than you. And they declare that the world isn't falling apart, but rather that the world is full of his glory. Now, I don't know if you know this or not, but God is called holy more times in the Bible than any other thing. More than he's called loving, more than he's called mighty, more than he's called merciful, 
It is the one attribute that is called more often holy. Isaiah himself calls him uh, God or the Holy One 30 times just in this book. It's a theme that he keeps coming back to. I know God is love. I, I know God is loving. I know God is gracious and merciful. But that is not the core of who he is. That's not the one word that you use to describe God. I know some people go to 1 John 4 immediately and say, oh, well, the Bible says God is love. But please don't misunderstand that verse. It doesn't mean that love defines God. That verse is saying that God defines love. It's a very different conversation. Now, so let me take you to my study this week, to my office, a, a book called The Great Doctrines of the Bible by William Evans. In it, he writes, If there is any difference in importance in the attributes of God, that of his holiness seems to occupy the first place. It is to say the least, the one attribute which God would have his people remember more than any other. <clears throat> so just in case some of you think, well, that's just the Old Testament God. I believe in the New Testament God, and he's a wee bit more softer. Let me remind you when Jesus was teaching the disciples how to pray. He says, when you pray, say, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed, holy is your name. Let me further remind you that the word holy is the only adjective that is used to describe the third person of the Trinity. He is not referred to as the loving spirit. He's not referred to as the merciful spirit, the gracious spirit, the mighty spirit, the righteous spirit. He is known as the holy spirit. That's his designation. So, so here's, here's what I'm trying to say. You can't pick and choose which characteristics of God come to the fore. You can't decide which ones you like and leave out the rest. Whenever we're talking to people, we have to present God as who he is. We, can't, we can either accept it or reject it. What we can't do is pick and choose. You can't turn around and say, I don't like that part of God, but I like these bits. My God isn't holy. My God's loving. It doesn't work like that. In Japan, there's an interesting temple in Kyoto. It's called the Temple of a Thousand Buddhas. And there's actually a thousand and one carvings of Buddha, each one slightly different to the other. And the idea is that worshippers can come in and they find a Buddha that appeals to them most. And they go and they worship at that uh, marking or, or uh, depiction. <clears throat> That's very much a modern approach to worship that we create God in our own image and then we worship that image that we've created. As Christians, we don't get to do that. We cannot change his nature and holiness is key to who he is. And of all the things that the angel could sing about, they sing of his holiness. Now, whenever you see repetition in the Bible, it's important, it's there for emphasis, especially whenever we're reading the Hebrew. So let's put it in modern terms. If we were over in Afghanistan, for example, tonight, there's a war. And so we would say, that's a war. But maybe if we're going about something bigger, say the Second World War, we would say, oh, that's a war, war. You know, there's a war, but that's a war, war. But then maybe if you're going to Armageddon, you might say, oh, that's a war, war, war. Or maybe if we're going to speak about a storm and say, well, that was a horrible storm that we had last week, or it's a horrible storm blowing outside. But then maybe if Hurricane Katrina, we might say, well, that was a storm, storm. The beast from the east was a storm, storm. But then there's this characteristic of God. He's not holy. He's not holy, holy. He is holy, holy. It is the only attribute of God to be spoken of in these terms. The angels could have signed faithful, 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 but they didn't. They could have said loving, 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 but they didn't. They could have said merciful, 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 but they didn't. They would be right to do so because he is all those things. But rather they said, no, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. So when we say that God is holy, we are, when we speak of God's holiness, what we're saying is that there is no one at all ever like him. He is set apart completely. Nothing compares to who he is. He is unparalleled. He is unique. He is unprecedented. He is exclusive. 
And I think this has been lost from many churches. We prefer to talk about God's comfort and God's nearness. And I think we have, in some cases, lost the reality of the transcendent holiness of God. He is not the big guy upstairs or the big guy in the sky. I don't know who you're talking about when you use those terms, but it's not God. God is an ineffable glory. He dwells in unapproachable light. God is a consuming fire. That's who he is. Leaders, volunteers, before you start and step out and serve God in ministry this year, make sure you get a firm view of who God is. Make sure you know whom it is you are serving. He is a holy God, enthroned in heaven, and that changes everything. Because when we look at it, we see, okay, before, you know, not only did Isaiah see God, but then suddenly he's very aware of himself. So before you go out and serve God, I need you to see yourself as well. That's what happened to Isaiah. All of a sudden, was confronted with the holiness of God. He went, yep, I'm a sinner. I'm gone. I'm dead. That's me. Done. Verse 5 says, woe to me. I am ruined. I, I'm a man of unclean lips. I've seen the king. Yeah, I'm done. I'm just gone. That's me. Why? Why did he react like that? Why must that be? Because in seeing a holy God... I need to recognize my unholy self. I realize just how unlike him I am. That's why, because myself next to God, he is so holy, he exposes my unholiness. And so there's this deep conviction, this deep awareness of where I am exactly in relation to him. You show me a person filled with pride who thinks they're fine, who thinks that they have no sin. I'll show you a person who's never encountered God as holy. He's just so different. He's so utterly unique. You know what it's like whenever you're standing beside somebody who can really sing? You know, we all like to sing in the shower, you know, or maybe in the car whenever no one else is around, you know, and, you know, we like to sort of knock out a couple of tunes. But whenever you're standing beside somebody who can really sing, you just think, well, like, I'm not even going to bother. <laughs> I'm not even going to embarrass myself by opening my mouth beside this person. Because the difference is stark. You become so very acutely aware of your tongue level whenever you see somebody who can really sing. Well, this prophet, the holiest one in Israel, the one who was set aside because of his devotion, next to the holy God, confesses his utter bankruptcy. Jesus calls it being poor in spirit. Max Licato, the author, puts it this way. He says, you don't impress officials at NASA with your paper airplane. You don't boast about your crayon sketches when you're in the presence of Picasso. You don't claim equality with Einstein just because you can write down H2O. And you don't boast about goodness in the presence of perfection. Now this characteristic of God is so monumental, so central that you find reactions like Isaiah just scattered throughout the Bible. Think of Job. Job was almost perfect. God said so himself. He says there's nobody like him in the whole earth. He's as good as they come. And towards the end of his experience, Job says to God, I have heard you by hearing, but now my eyes see you. Therefore, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. He encountered God. It happened to Peter as well. Peter was a boastful, aggressive, expert fisherman overall. All right, Peter was a guy who threw this like he never lacked confidence, right? <laughs> Big fish, little pond syndrome. This was Peter. And he gets Jesus in the boat and 10 minutes later he says, depart from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. He's not saying I'm the big short fisherman. I am the guy who knows everything that there is to know about boats. He says, no, I'm just a sinful man. His perspective changed. He encountered God. The apostle John in the book of Revelation has this vision of Christ and he says, I fell on my face as dead. He encountered God. Now if we have time to turn to it, I'll take you through Revelation 4. It's fascinating. We're in the throne room and the angels and the elders are all around the throne room of God. 
Remember those elders, they had their crowns on their head. What did they do with those crowns? They cast them down, saying the same anthem, holy, holy, holy. And they take off their crowns and they throw those crowns before God's throne. As if to say, God, in your presence, no honour at all can come to me. Are you kidding me? There's no way I deserve anything. No, all the glory, all the honour, all the dominion, everything. It has to go to you because I see you. I get who you are. So no, this can't be mine. You have it. Because no one rightly viewing God wants any honour or any glory. It all has to go to him. And Isaiah has this and he's so overcome by a need for purity. So the angel comes and touches his lips with the hot coal. Remember, I'm a man of unclean lips. So the coal touches his lips and the angel says, you're clean. He's purged. That's the idea. Now, why does this happen? It's God's holiness again. It's God's holiness that makes this happen. It happens to Isaiah the prophet because holiness cannot exist with unholiness. Something has to happen. Something has to change. Unless, number one, God destroys that which is unholy or God purges that which is unholy and makes it righteous. It's something that's unique to God. Think of um, muddy clothes after a rugby match, right? Okay, you come in and you're just pigging head to toe and what you do is you get a nice good white towel and you rub yourself down with it. The cleanliness of the white towel does not transfer over to the muddy rugby shirt. The dirt from the shirt transfers over to the white towel. And all you do is end up with two dirty garments. But not so with God. Such is his purity and righteousness, such is his holiness, that he removes the blemishes from our lives. Your sins, though they be like scarlet, I will make them whiter than snow. I will make them clean. Church, listen to me very clearly. Let me say this with all the love uh, as I can muster, with the passion I can make. If you want to serve God effectively, you must make sure you do so with sin purged. Isaiah understands this now. He sees God. God is so holy, so high and lifted up, and he goes, I'm garbage, okay? I'm done. I am a wreck. And he gets cleansed. He sees the gulf, and he addresses the gulf between him and God. Here's one of the reasons why so many people will come to church week after week and there's no change in their life at all. From whether it's week to week, month to month, year to year. The reason why they don't change and they don't grow is because they don't see the great gulf that exists between them and a holy God. Evidence when somebody prays something like this. God, if I have sinned, please forgive me. If, if. How about since I have sinned? How about because I am a sinner? If you can't come before God and acknowledge that you have sins, that you, that you fall short, that pride will always, always act as a barrier between you being fully used by God. You'll always think, well, I'm good, I'm grand, I'm not as bad as those guys, I'm not as bad as those ones over there, at least I don't do that. But all it does is expose the fact that you do not see God as holy, holy, holy. Isaiah sees God holy, high and enthroned. And then maybe for the first time he truly sees himself. Woe is me. I am a man of unclean lips. But then church, just as we finish, I need you to see the need. See the Lord. See yourself. See the need. Verse 8. I heard a voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Here am I. Send me. You know what I love? It's that God looks for volunteers. He doesn't force a person to do something that they don't want to do. He doesn't guilt a person into service. He simply calls and waits for people to respond. I think there's far too many Christian organizations and churches 
they have a high, very high turnover of, of volunteers because they're trying to force something that isn't of God. You shouldn't serve unless you feel called to do it. That sense of, I want to do that. I need to do that. I see a need and I have to respond. I have to do something because uh, I need to help them. I, I need to share that. I want to get in there with them. That's a calling. And so he comes to God and he says, I'm available. I don't know what I can do, but here I am. You know, a year ago, I stood on this stage and took a step that many pastors told me that they'd love to have done over the last two years, but effectively they said they didn't have the stomach to do it. As a leadership, we cleared all our committees and organizations and says, okay, if you're serious, step forward again. We did it for a number of reasons that you are aware of. Uh, I could tell that some people had lost the vision for the work. They were just going through the motions. Some were trying to serve God while living in sin. Others were serving God, but they ended up getting stuck in a rut. They had volunteered to fill in for someone for two weeks and ended up being stuck with it for eight years. <laughs> and it's like, how did I end up here? And they needed permission to step away. So as a church, we said in faith, okay, let's see what happens. And you this evening represent the volunteers who said, no, I'm still in. I'm still in. I still see the need. I believe in the need. There's a mission here. So here I am. Church, send me. Use me. God, if I can do anything here, use me. And as a leadership, we're thankful for it. Because not everyone came back. If that is you, don't worry. There's still room for you. There's still room for you. But only whenever you come to a place where you can see the need in light of a holy God who's at work in your life. There's a flow to this. First, you need to get a place where you get a real vision of who God is. Holy and exalted, seated on the throne then you need to see yourself in light of who he is. God, I'm a sinner. I need you to move and work in my life. And then you can turn your focus outwards. There are children, there are young people, there are adults, there are pensioners, there are men and women, husbands and wife, families, blended families of all different combinations of people who need to hear about the Savior. He needs to be encouraged in their faith and taught and discipled and loved and nurtured and cared for and brought through. There are people who have never heard or appreciated the fact that they're a sinner. And if they do not repent, there's an eternity in hell waiting for them. Does that matter to anyone here? Does anybody care what that means? Do these people mean anything when you drive past them, when you walk past them? Does it matter to you? Folks, the one thing that will drive you when you see a holy God and a merciful Savior is that you'll see people not as someone who's getting in your way or slowing down your drive to work, but rather people who are souls and they're going to hell and it will break your heart and it will compel you to act. That's the moment when you can truly say, God, here I am. Here I am. Send me. I don't care where. I don't care to who. But send me. This whole holiness thing. This is not optional. This is not an extra thing that the Christian nerds can do for brownie points. This is something that we are all called to be. The Bible's filled with this truth. God said to his people, Leviticus 11, you shall be holy for I am holy. In other words, if you want me to be your heavenly father, then you need to be father like son. If I'm holy, guess what? You got to be holy as well. You got to step up and be more like me. That's what I'm calling you to do. That's what I'm calling you to be. Be holy because I'm holy. That's the Bible verse that sent me to the college, Bible college. 
Hebrews 1 says, Pursue holiness without which no one will see the Lord. 1 Thessalonians 4 says, This is the will of God, your sanctification, which is a fancy word for saying your holiness. That's God's will. So if you're listening to this tonight and you say, well, I want to know God's will for my life. I want to know what the next step is. I'm going to tell you, God's will for your life is holiness. So hold on, Jeff. I, I thought God wants me to be happy. No, he never promised that. He wants you to be holy. But here's what you'll find. The holier you and I become, the happier we become. Because we live with an abiding satisfaction that I'm pleasing him, that I'm fulfilling a deeper purpose, that there's something real here that I'm doing and I'm seeing results. There's nothing better than that. So I'm going to pray now and then we'll have our closing song. Can I just ask everyone to close their eyes now? And as you do that, I, I want you to listen to me very carefully. Because this isn't something that we do very often uh, as a church, but... As we close in prayer, I'm going to pray that we grasp a better sense of who God is. I'm going to be praying that as volunteers we serve God in that pursuit of holiness. But what I would like you to do is that if you want to declare that you too want to seek more <coughs> of God, to have that deeper sense of holiness, that deeper vision of who he is, then I want you to stand. Do you want to be made available for God to use you in a way that he hasn't been <coughs> over the last few years, over the last while? Do you want to be more in awe of his holiness then? I invite you to stand. As we stand, and what we're saying is, I want more. I want more of God. I want more than what I have right now in front of me. Deeper vision of who He is. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for who you are. That you are not just holy, but you are holy, holy, holy. And I pray, Lord, for those who are standing here this evening, I pray that we get a sense of that deeper vision of who you are, Lord, draw near to us, Lord, as we pray, as we read, as we pursue you, Lord, that may we be captivated by who you are, Lord, may we serve you with a vision that, that, that sees souls that are lost, that sees souls that are in need, Lord, and we are compelled and driven, not because we have any worth in ourselves, but because we see the surpassing worth of knowing you, we see that great joy in who you are. We're in awe of our salvation that such a holy God would love a sinner like me. And we pray, Lord, that as we pursue you and love you and serve you, Lord, you would see fit to bless and have your hand and have your seal on the work of this church, Lord. That these people who stand to serve you, Lord, would be set apart for you. Lord, that you'd set them on fire and that they would bring great glory and honour to you. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Folks, thank you. Brian, thank you.
and so we can be in tonight, we'll not just fade away as we drive back down the road and get on the TV and stick the kettle on. But Lord, this would be something that resonates. That this is a watershed moment. Lord, that we have, have made a commitment, Lord, that we choose to be holy. For you are holy. And we pray, Lord, that it resonates and transcends into every aspect of our lives. Lord, from campaigners tomorrow night, taller than Tuesday, to Youth Quake, Youth Fellowship, Eagles on Saturday, Lord, we pray that you'll be at work this week in this church. And we pray, Lord, that you'd save souls. Lord, that you'd restore relationships, heal wounds that have been infected and, and bitter over years. Lord, that you'd break chains of addiction and that you'd restore lives. Lord, we pray that you would do amazing things. Not because of who we are, but because of who you are. Lord, do this for your name's sake. Do it for your glory, we pray. Amen.